last 24 hours. Thank you. We are recording as always. All sessions are recorded and we are making them available on the Vuva platform and on YouTube later on as well. Um, so in the chat, what is one thing that made you laugh in the last 24 hours? There must be something. My daughter's dancing. Thank you, Kate Newman in track. I'm still missing your uh, your English, uh, your, your sorry, your English, your language preference in your name. Antares, my partner laughing. Other people make us laugh. Isn't that beautiful? Ah, oh, for the first time, my do your daughter told you a joke. That's great. <laughs> Moses talking about winter in Uganda, maybe <laughs> yesterday in a session, I guess. There must be something. Yeah, there's always something that makes us love and that gives us joy in our life. So um, keep it coming, actually. Um, and one last um, time, I want to ask you to rename yourself, name, surname, and your language preference for the breakout rooms that we're going to have um, later on. Um, so we're really excited about this session. Um, but before we dive into the content a little bit more, we want to land with you in this session. And um, the session is about an exploration of the inner work that is needed. And, and for that, I will um, invite Mary Ann Clement um, actually to do um, a short breathing exercise with us or uh, an embodiment exercise. Actually, I don't know what she's going to do. I'm very curious <laughs> myself. Um, Mary Ann, uh, we're going to hear from you later on. You're um, from Healing Solidarity. Uh, where you're part of the advisory circle and co-director, um, but you're also co-CEO um, at ADD International, leading a transformation process in an INGO um, yourself. So we really, you, you, you really have something to say, but first we want to breathe with you or embody something with you. Over to yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. And so I'm going to, I'm going to keep it quite simple. I am going to invite people to breathe if you choose. And like, importantly, this is an offer and you can choose to participate in it with me or you can choose to just watch me or you can choose if to turn your video off if you have it on so that you can just know that no one's watching you or if you want you know you can leave it on I'll leave mine on <laughs> um, but I am going to invite you if you choose to perhaps close your eyes and I'm going to do that because I find it easier to really kind of connect to myself when I do that but some people might want to look out of their view I'm actually lucky today I'm in some mountains in the northwest of the UK and I've got a lovely view so if you've got a lovely view, you might want to look at that as well. But I'm going to close my eyes just to bring my awareness kind of back within. <clears throat> and as David said, we're, this session is about the inner work. And I'm just going to invite you to, um, if you choose and if it feels comfortable and accessible for you, to just notice your breath. So there's no need to change your breath at all but just notice it coming in and out of the body. Just maybe noticing it for the next three or four breaths. And the breath literally being something that's always with us, but that we often forget. I'm going to invite you again if you choose and if it feels comfortable and accessible for you to also maybe breathe a little bit deeper. Notice if that changes anything about how you're feeling today and how the breath feels. And as I breathe a little bit deeper, for me, I notice that when I breathe into my belly, that's a place where sometimes for me, like different emotions, different feelings come up. So the breath is one way to connect to how I'm doing 
and what's arising. That gives an additional layer to what I get in my mind. I'm going to invite you again, if you choose to perhaps notice which part of you is connected to the floor or your seat. If you've got a chair behind you, you might want to lean back. I want to feel your feet on the floor if they're on the floor or your or your bum on your seat. Just become aware of a part of you that's connected to something that's below you, the floor or the seat or the chair behind you even, something that's supporting you. And as you become aware of that, inviting you to become aware also of connection to the earth more broadly. So that might be just below you, or it might be many floors down if you're up high. But just in your mind's eye, envisaging maybe a connectedness to the earth. A groundedness or a rootedness. That sense of gravity that does literally hold us to the planet. I'm noticing how that feels in your body to connect to that. Again, something that's always there, right? But that we sometimes lose sense of. And I like to imagine in these online sessions, we're all probably all over the world, people on this call, but that we are connected by the fact that we, this planet is our home. And so our connectedness to the earth, wherever we are on it and connected through these virtual spaces, but wherever we are on it, the beginning of our connectedness to each other is our connectedness to the land to the earth, to the planet that we call home. Despite all the contradictions in our relationship to the planet, that's what we share. And then finally, again, if you choose and if it's accessible and comfortable for you, inviting you to maybe have a bit of a stretch or a bit of a wiggle to notice maybe where in your body feels like. So for me right now, shoulders, but feels like it could do with a bit of a shake or a bit of a stretch. Just inviting you to do whatever feels good for you right now to feel that one or two percent more comfortable in your body more relaxed in your space as we enter the session together and the conversation that we'll have together today and if you have got your eyes closed or your camera off and you want to come back into the space inviting you to do that in your own time um Welcome everyone, it's great to be here. Um, yeah, uh, I can't remember if I ha handing back to David, I think. <laughs> Thank you so much, Marianne. That was really lovely. Um, feel very grounded now. Um, for those who came in late and were wondering about the crazy chat messages and the kind of what doesn't make sense, what, it, what, what are people posting in the chat? Um, the question was, what made you laugh within the last 24 hours? So maybe some of the chat messages make more sense now. Um, yeah, the, 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 the idea for this conversation, to, to have this conversation as well, was kind of, we spoke a lot about mindset shifts that are needed, a shift of or breaking patterns of behaviors, um, how we relate with each other in the sector, how... Um, with the, between different stakeholders, donors, INGOs, local CSOs, but also within organizations. 
Um, and yeah, also really to recognize um, and, and ch challenge some of our long held assumption. That's a tricky process and it requires honest and, and, and yeah, open reflection among all of us um, and a, read a readiness to sit uncomfortably. I think that was also one of the key quotes that was um, taken away and posted um, over the last days. Um, we need to be ready to sit in the uncomfortable space as well with each other. So we want to explore a little bit kind of the resources we require as individuals um, to prepare ourselves to, to, to shift our mindsets and embrace transformation in the sector. It's also an, acknowledge, an acknowledgement that actually there is um, there are a lot of people in our sector with a high level of self-motivation, of intrinsic motivation, and there is presence of burnout in the sector that are actually at quite high levels. Um, so we wanted to start with that. Um, if um, to our Leslie, I don't remember who's putting the chat into the in uh, the the link into the chat. Um, there's a link in the chat here on the Mentimeter. We want to know from you. How present is burnout in your professional life, actually? Um, in between, very present, not present at all. Just to get an Im impression of, of all of us in the room and how you relate to this. Perhaps a couple of more responses. Um, that would be great. Oh, yeah. Oh, now, now come the dots in the very present. It's actually the biggest by far now. Um, so this is just showing us the relevance of what we're talking about here. And while we are still watching um, the results popping in, one last reminder for those who just joined, please rename yourself to first name, um, surname, or family name, and then the language preference um, that you have for the breakout room conversations later on. This conversation wants to bring it home to us, the change inside us, the inner change and inner shifts that needed. So we want to really also um, offer some small breakout group conversations later on. For that, please choose your language. You can do that when you um, hoover over your own image um, um, and click on the three dots when you're on gallery view. Thank you so much. I think um, I'm going to hand over now to, to Janet. Um, for a conversation with Marianne. Thank you very much, David. I hope you can now hear me. Yes, okay, great. Uh, Marianne, thank you very much for that experience. Most of, and a couple of us hardly have <laughs> in our busy lives. We are always rushing up and down. And so it was very refreshing to, to kind of just stop for a moment and feel the chair, feel your feet and all that. So I personally appreciated that very much. And, um, you know, we are interested to just get a sense of how did you get into this? Um, maybe something about your own story and maybe what you've learned along the way. Yeah, yeah, um, for sure. So I... Um... I ran a, a small international NGO <clears throat> when I was quite in my 20s called, um, it's now called Able Child Africa. Um, and in my time, it was interesting because it was an international NGO that worked originally just in Uganda. <clears throat> and it had been started by um, people in, both in Uganda and in the UK. And they'd done, you know, it was 20, more than 20 years ago, they'd done a kind of localization in that they'd separated the UK and the and the Uganda office and I ran the UK office which was basically just a fundraising office but in the process of doing that I, I got very burnt out <laughs> because it was an a very basically the 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 there'd been this transformation and so a decision that most of the resources would be would be held in Uganda and managed there which was the right decision but there was still quite a lot that funders were expecting from us in the UK and I I managed to kind of basically burn myself out, I always say, because there's a lot of talk in the sector about, you know, the structural reasons why we're burnt out. And there are so many levels of, of why that happens in our organisation, not just in development, but way beyond it in, in, in our cultures. But actually, I, I always say, like, in a way, I burnt myself out by trying to trying to not spend too much money in the UK, trying to really support this, this um, transformed model. 
And, the, and when I stepped out of that role, um, I, I became a consultant for 10 years. And during that time, did a lot of actually kind of what people might describe as personal work of thinking, you know, how did I get myself into a position where I was so exhausted and, and working so hard? And, and some of it is personal. Like, I'm not a person that that sort of well-being comes naturally to. I'm a person who loves lot, doing lots of different things and being busy. And so I have to, like, be very intentional, actually, about the grounding and the well-being piece, which I think, you know, they say you talk about the thing that... Um, that you need most and that's true for me right I, I can love to do lots <laughs> I'm not a person who will just have like one thing and focus on it I would find that you know impossible so um, I learned a lot about myself but I also had this growing sense that within the development sector there were so many people who had a sense that the way they were working was kind of out of sync with their values so they knew we needed change they knew we needed to reimagine how we work People were talking, you know, when I first started my career in the 90s about how we needed to what we would now might call shift power or share power, but that like, people didn't know how to make it happen. And, and in its place, there were just so many exhausted people that I was working with as a consultant, you know, and I did this sort of very mini kind of bit of my own research and talked actually to women who were sort of in my networks. And almost everyone I talked to, I had like three questions. I don't recall exactly what they were now, but they were kind of like, what's, what is it you do? And kind of how's your well-being? And they were really simple. I came off every call thinking, blimey, everyone's exhausted. <laughs> There's something not right here. They feel they want to do things differently, but they don't even have time to think about what that would look like. So I started to kind of connect some dots and feel that the way that our kind of uh, ways of working were kind of working against both transformative change and also like people's well-being there, there was some kind of connection between them and that's really what so Healing Solidarity is a project that I co-lead now and we run actually online events a bit like this and we sort of talk at this intersection of transformational change that the sector needs in terms of shifting power in terms of building anti-racist practice in terms of you know how we can bring more justice and more equity to what we do all of the things that have been talked about I know a lot um, but also this intersection of how do we do that in a way that cultivates well-being because to some extent well-being across the board so for people working in the sector and 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 those that we work with like well-being to 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 a greater extent is our goal and we just can't we can't um create a, a, a more equitable more um, just world if we're all burnt out and exhausted and unable to to to, to create change in our organization so that's sort of like the conversation that I've been interested in for some time now um I'll stop there because you've probably got questions and, and we want to have a conversation but yeah that's kind of where my thinking came from Thank you so much, uh, Marianne, for that. And as you have seen from the poll, there are many of us who struggle with burnout in our yeah. sector. Yeah. Because I think we get into it with a lot of passion and all that and believe we are changing the world. And in the process, yes. we are we kind of finishing ourselves. Yes. So what would you highlight as one or two lessons you've been learned along that journey? I think it's interesting because now, um, as David said, I'm in a co-leadership role in an, an NGO, and we're run, you know, we're 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 driving quite an quite an ambitious transformation process. And what I'm learning is, I have to keep reminding myself about this. <laughs> like it's not easy, and I think, you know, that there are so many reasons for that. I think we we in general haven't set our organisations up to have space for reflection and self-care but also collective care like how we um, can support one another are often missing in kind of organizational cultures there's been so much focus on um, you know project management monitoring and evaluation these kind of technical very technical things and and then many organizations you know like including my own maybe a, a less focus on the relational work the self-reflective work the, the ways of supporting one another and so it is actually something that we have to be intentional about like that you know and I I've been thinking about this for a long time and still I have to be intentional both with myself and you know I I'm I regularly 
sort of don't meet my own standards, both for me, but also for, for our teams at ADD, because, you know, it, it transformation takes work in itself. There's obviously, you know, funding challenges related to that. In general, transformation as a sort of thing to do isn't funded, as it, you know, like it, it's hard to get someone to give you money to transform your teams, to transform your culture. So a lot of that work is done sort of, you know, as you go along and it, it's imperfect, right? The, you know, even, even, even with the intention that I've put to thinking about it over particularly over the last five years, I, it still feels imperfect. And I think my kind of second lesson would be that, you know, change and transformation in our sector is is not just going to be uncomfortable in the ways that people have talked about, but also sometimes a bit messy and a bit tricky. And it, you know, it's it, we what we need to be able to do is help both ourselves as leaders, but also our people to 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 understand that that's a part of of transformation. That there's going to be some difficulty. That there's going to be some challenge, and that actually thinking about how we can find ways to support people through that um it, you know in, in ways that are possible and at the same time know that you can't kind of make everything easy but that it, it doesn't work like that um yeah those would be my two things I basically that I have to keep reminding myself and also that you know we need we need to anticipate some challenge for ourselves as individuals and also I know the session is framed as individuals but actually thinking about our team at uh, ad international and, and just more generally about other clients that I've had there is also a collective piece to that you know that kind of inner work you know it's also how how do you help groups of people move through change right thank you so much I I honestly can relate to that um, the idea that we have to be intentional it won't just happen and, and we need reminders because every so often we'll be overtaken by our commitment and interest in what we are trying to do that we might just lose it in the process. So I'm sure a number of us here would, would, would resonate with what you are you're saying. And just to move further, I was just wondering then what would you consider as some of the key principles that you feel kind of relate with this, this kind of work that um, we can take with us? Yeah, um, I tried to think about key principles before and, and, and one of the things that I sort of hold in this whole kind of transformation work is that, um, that there, are, there are some principles and then at the same time there's no sort of like blueprint, <laughs> you know, like every organisation is different, every context is different, um, you know, so um, the context that I'm working in now different from others I've worked in as a consultant and so forth and so I think that there's some things that we can learn from each other and then I think ultimately um, transformation within INGOs is going to look different in different organizations so I think for me that's a, a key principle is that you kind of have to let it emerge you, you know, you can't necessarily follow the other organization over that blueprint and, and it will work for you. And I think that's a lot about the fact that, you know, we need to think about different contexts, right? So much of this conversation about um, shifting or sharing power is about um, is about being really rooted in the context that we work in and they're going to be different, necessarily different and well-being looks different in different contexts as well. So it's really important not to assume that, you know, my well-being is necessarily, you know, going to be going to be um, supported by the same things as yours or, or, or vice versa. Like for some people, well-being is is you know hiking up a hill every morning I'm just saying a hill because I'm looking out at one and then and another it's just getting more rest and another it's you know having more time off and so so we really have to to to, to let this be contextual um and at the same time to as as we said before pay keep paying attention to it I think for me with it in INGOs we need to cultivate more and this is in myself as much as in other people but um cultivate more practice around self-reflection and relationship building and and you know as much as much attention to that as we pay to our technical skills so for example if I look at the sort of training out there for INGOs so much of it focuses on 
currently on technical skills and yet the skills we're going to need for the sort of change that we're is now beginning to be talked about much more widely our relationship building that you can't build solidarity if you can't build relationships well you know that's solidarity emerges out of relational conversations it doesn't emerge from me knowing how to do a log freight for you know it's a it's a blunt example but I think we need to really think about the skills that we're developing in our people that we're hiring for that we're supporting people in and some of that is going to be about this I think it's been talked about before this week the sort of letting go and you know there's some there's some grief for people in their roles changing there's some kind of composting almost that has to happen and I I do think of nature as a bit of an inspiration in that like in order for new shoots to grow and there are lots coming up right now as well as this interrogation of what our role is as INGOs we also have to let some things die and that's not something that we cultivate usually in organizations or in in our staff teams but actually that's that that acceptance that actually my role is going to have to change an individual our role as an organization is going to have to change is about there is you know letting go and and kind of composting what doesn't work and letting new shoots of something emerge and I think you know when when we started healing solidarity I thought of it as I thought of there, there being a need for um, a solidarity that, um, that that supports justice rather than perpetuating injustice in some of the ways that we talk about the sect having perpetuated injustice. But in order to get there, we have to let go of some of the ways we've been and some of the things that we've been doing. And that that's, yeah, I think that's finding ways to support people in that and I don't have all the answers for that only the kind of knowing that that's important and to some extent it needs to emerge rather than as I said there being like a five point plan you know this is how it's like obviously the the grief of your role changing is different to the, the grief of losing someone but you know you can't plan for losing someone and you probably can't plan for for this kind of grief that's involved in transformation fully but you can be ready to hold it within your organization and your colleagues in yourself by knowing that you know it's normal to find this sort of change challenging right and that actually maybe I need to think about who can I reach out to, whether that's sort of formal support in the, you know, mentoring or coaching or whatever, or whether that's more informal support, someone that I know I can check in with, a buddy or a peer, or, you know, just to be able to hold yourself through change, because it's, it, it's a different ask from just being asked to sort of repeat tasks as they are. And yeah, change is always with us, but I think that where we're moving through in organisations now is is a point of some things need, being need need some things we need to let go of them. I kind of think of it as um, it, we're in the sort of autumn phase where, which in the UK we are now anyway, in so it's sort of an easy reference for me. But um, you know, where there's a bit of a letting go and a bit of a hibernation, and a, you know, and it's not that it's not quite the the same and it's not the same energy as oh I've got this solution and I can fix the world it's actually I need to have a different role in that I need to I need to re-envisage my role in that and and it can't be just me particularly me as in a white person in the global north having the answers to solving poverty somewhere else in the world but maybe my role is different and it's about solidarity and it's about shifting resources towards justice and you know that it feels different and it feels different in the body which is why also those that kind of reflection we did at the beginning just thinking about bringing very small bits of that into your day and noticing how does it feel as you move through these conversations and then also through the practice of them because it's one thing to say um yeah I I know that this change we need to reimagine an INGOs and we need to reimagine sector and it's another thing to do it day to day and day to day means changing how we do lots of little things as well as those big vision statements and pledges it's like how do I engage with my finance director how do I engage with my team how do you know and it, and we get it wrong and we trip up and we have to check you know we have to keep building bridges and, and changing how we do things so 
um yeah i i think i've i've probably given a lot of points <laughs> maybe you can pull them out <laughs> Oh, you are actually spot on. Um, and I think one of the things I hear very strongly from you is this is not one of those things you get money for. It has to do with you, you yeah. working within yourself to, to recognize what context am I in? What am I dealing with? Um, how, do I, how do I pause? What's going on around me? Being reflective, building relationships around me so that I can begin to deal with what I'm going through. So you know, it's, a, it's an inner work as this session is being called. Mm -hmm. And so we hear you. Thank you so much for sharing. I think I'll hand it over to David to take us to the next stage. Thank you so much, Janet. Um, and thank you so much, Mary Ann, for sharing. Um, it's very in insightful. I, I, I like the um, autumn um, image as well. Um, and so this is a moment where we would love to invite all of you um, to have um, a conversation with some peers here in breakout rooms. Um, we have set that up. We um, I've just posted to uh, potential um, prompts, questions in the chat, but you can just also chat whatever um, was triggered for you by this conversation between Marianne and Janet. Um, and um, my colleagues in the background, I think, are busy setting up the breakout room. So whenever this is a conversation for 10 minutes, so please make sure that everybody has a chance to, to, to share. Um, they're done. So let's go into breakout rooms. Um, the question is, how much space and attention do you give to your own well-being? How much space is given to inner work in your organization? Or whatever was triggered for you by the conversation between Marianne and Janet. Let's go. People should be going off now. Um, and Janet, please just pick it up directly, I would say. So welcome back. Um, I hope you had um, exciting conversations. And even if you can't exhaust, I hope it will prompt you to want to follow somebody up and have this conversation or at the office and just open that can of worms so that you know, we can unpack it. So um, the question that we uh, would like to explore a little is what are the kind of internal changes that are needed by people leading this kind of transformation. Did you get any insights? So we hear a bit of reaction before we get to Mary, Marianne. Um, or oh, shall I? No, uh, we're, we're happy to share, I'm sure. I was in a wonderful group. And uh, one of the things that I shared was the, the fact that I literally went through burnout literally had to go to hospital, literally collapsed and 100%. So it does happen. And uh, after all the tests and everything and consultations, the doctor said to me that our sector is very deceiving because we feel like we have to save everybody, but we never save ourselves. And this is so true because in my previous job, uh, I had to go to communities where you saw children with no shoes or families and, and then you leave and you go to your hotel and then you get on a plane and then you go and then you're like, you know, you're, you're, you're in that space where you're leaving people, you can solve their problems. And, uh, uh, you know, we talked about trying to find the balance, you know, but uh, the key that I wanted to share was the doctor said to me, if you don't look after yourself, how are you going to save the people you want to save. So that is a massive takeaway about looking after yourself because this sector, you know, makes us think we have to save the world and it's very difficult to draw the line. Yeah. Thank you very much, Chibwe. I can relate to that and I think I've gotten very close to that at one time. <laughs> 
So that is a very common experience among us. Anyone else would like to share before we have a take some words from our main speaker? Is it very common that we are saving the world, but we are forgetting ourselves? The savior is needs to be saved. Yeah, is someone speaking? Yeah. Fifi, yeah. yeah. Fifi, yeah. 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 Sorry. I raise my hand, but she can go, and I'll come in after. Thank you. Fifi, you can go ahead if you're ready. Yes, 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 yes. So, uh, sorry, I have a bit of an echo in the background. Let me rectify that. We as well. Sorry. sorry about that. We can't quite yeah. hear that. Is it okay now? Okay, try now. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, I think uh, um, this topic is really important in the sense that um, we, we we've all you know we all participate in this conference to change a system that's not working or that's not working for us and i think oftentimes we focus on the entire system and forget the people who will be working in the system to or to lead this system and i believe that if the people are in a good place the system will work automatically because at the end of the day you need the system is going to be run by people so as much as we are focusing on you know, changing the system and how it works and how it doesn't favor certain people, we also need to look at the people themselves. You know, I think if everybody's in a good place, we'll end up treating everybody better. And that will, in effect, come together to create a better system for us to you know, work in as a whole. So it is imperative that we also be critically assess our well-being and our breakdown systems and see how best we can work in an environment that's enabling to the people themselves and then to the people we are trying to help also. And I think um, that is what I can contribute. Thank you. Thank you very much, spot on. Did I see Mohammed or, and I can't see, we have very little time, so let's be brief. Mohammed, did I see your hand or did I miss it? Okay, if Mohammed is not ready, I go to Smruti Patel. Thank you. Yeah, um, yeah. Just uh, I, I said something in the chat, but we are so good at doing because we are real doers in our sector, right? We need to get things done, and we actually don't reflect enough on our own power, right? We think we are so powerful and we can do everything. But I think we need more reflection on our, our own power and in different ways, right? Our power over others, but also oneself and how much one can do. Um, and then the second thing is about being, right? We are really not focused on how we are being with each other or about being with ourselves, right? Um, and I think that, that uh, yeah, that doing and being is always fighting with each other. <laughs> and not having enough time for reflection uh, and being with each other. So I think that's where kind of the, the I think the tension uh, comes in and we need to think more about how we, how, how do we do something from being, right? From being well. Uh, and that way we can, we can co contribute better and maybe hit more healthier as well. Thank you very much. Please put on the chat because we are clearly running out of time. I can see David is wondering what, whether I'm, I'm looking at my watch. No? <laughs> yeah. Put on the chat because I think we'll gather more and that information will be collated so that it will not be lost. So just feel free to put on the chat. Mohaben, you have one word. I had seen your hand. Yeah. Thank you very much, Janet. I agree with you and I think uh, it's even common with those of us from the South because uh, you try so much to please your masters. And you think that uh, you need 25 hours a day to please your masters. And you will never get more than 24 hours. But the fact remains that on daily basis, you are looking at what kind of request do I have on my table, either on leave or not. And so most of us, hardly do we even take our annual leave. 
And anytime we deceive ourselves that we are going to take the lead, we take and still be in active working mood. So there has been a difficulty. I think it's not about the fact that we do not know the kind of power that we have. It's about using the power, using that kind of that kind of opportunity, that kind of right that you have to say, look, please let me do the work and take care for myself for a particular period. The work must stop at some point. Thank you. Thank you very much. I want to give Marianne a chance to just kind of see what 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 final remarks or words of wisdom you'd give us. But clearly, there's a lot that is coming out, and I think we all can identify with this. Marianne, please go. I thought the last few reflections were were a really valuable addition and contribution. So I don't want to add too much. Um, it, Hope Chugudu, who's a feminist activist and facilitator many people might know her she she's a, a friend and colleague of mine and uh, sometimes her words ring in my ear she always says well-being is the work right in a way well, there's a way that well-being is the work and there's a way like what Mohammed just said that this inequitable power relations that are steeped into our sector has like fractured us from that knowing and that realization and so like it's incumbent on us, particularly I think those of us who sit in centers, closer to centers of power in, in the global north to really take this well-being agenda on board and, and, and understand our power and our impact on others <clears throat> and understand that it's, as, as Mohammed said, affecting their well-being, the ways that we, that we behave and that we operate and that we need to change that. So I just want to close with that, I think. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, we hear you loud and clear. Over to you, David. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, I'm really glad we, we had this session as well. Um, we've got two more sessions today, um, but you, you already see kind of over the last days, we really gathered a lot of different points, what needs to change and how it can be changed. Um, we map the change that's, that's happening. This was about bringing it home to us. The next session that's on um, is about bringing it home to our organizations, how to bring our colleagues um, on this journey um, along with us, um, learning from some pioneers in organizational transformation. Um, this is on in 15 minutes already. Um, and then we have our big closing session beyond Ringo. What's next? How can we move this forward together? Um, because obviously um, we're, we're, we're not done. Um, the sector transformation is not done. Um, so um, please join us for these two next sessions. Um, we're really excited. Thank you again, Janet. Thank you again, Mary Ann. Thank you everyone um, again to everyone. Um, what a pleasure. See you in the next sessions. Can we even have, um, yeah, just logistical announcement. We're going to be on the same link. Um, so um, we're going to put all participants into the waiting room in just a second um, in order to prep for the next session here in the room. Um, if you want to stay on the link, you can do that. Otherwise, you can just rejoin in 15 minutes as well um, with our lovely Jim hosting the next session. Thank you so much.